Hey, welcome to uh, the Greenway. This is a special video podcast edition of our regular newsletter. I am Randy Charles, the founder of Greenway Steel. Today, uh, I'm pleased to be joined with Mark Bula. Mark was uh, the founding chief commercial officer of H2 Green Steel. He spent some time also as a CEO with Vulcan Green Steel. And uh, in between projects right now, Mark and I thought we'd have a good time chatting a little bit about his experience uh, around sustainability, green steel, um, some of the fun stuff that he got involved in, but to kind of equate that uh, with our experiences within the steel industry over the last, uh, Mark, I think it's like 30 years we've been working together, huh? Yeah, it's been a long time, Randy. And that's, it's, it's not good to say that, right? But it has been a while, that's for sure. I, I'll be in the industry 35 years come April or May, I think. It's hard to believe that I've been in this industry for 35 years. Where does time you know, go? It, 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 well, we were working together in 1995. We first started working together. And uh, at the time, we were involved uh, with a compact strip production, the introduction of that product into the marketplace, particularly up in Chicago and Detroit and automotive and, and many mill steel for flat rolled steel making. And uh, I, I equate so much of what we see today. I mean, that was a fun time. And yeah, we've you know, learned the technology a was, oh, I, I equate so much of what we're seeing today with, you know, as, as energized as we were back then, not rolling out this new technology and, and getting uh, product acceptance in the marketplace and, 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 and rapidly, rapidly improving on the technology and the product quality. So much of it I equate with what we're seeing today around green steel, yeah, decarbonization, right? Yeah, I would, you know, it's, you know, I think we, back then, Randy, we thought it was a sea change, right? It was a sea change in the industry. Yeah. It certainly was in the U.S., right? And you can look back now yeah. and say, wow, we know now the change that was created by those compact strip production mills that came in for flat roll um, yeah. in, in the late 80s, early 90s. But we, we saw it as a huge sea change in our industry. That's why you and I were so jazzed about it back then, right? Yeah. I mean, it was a lot of fun. I know you and I have at least once in our careers have said, God, wouldn't it be nice to go back and just work for Mike Wagner again in Crawfordsville, Indiana? <laughs> I mean, so shout out to Mike because he brought us together, right? I, I think it was a lot of fun and it was, we felt like we were at sort of the tip of the sword at that point. Yeah. And I think the the there is a bit of a new sea change going on, but you got a question, is it changing because in the EU it's policy driven to get into green right. steel? Um, is it, is it, Policy that came first, or did the integrate did the integrated or blast furnace and uh, basic oxygen furnace mills realize they needed to change? It's interesting in Europe, you know, they they really haven't made that evolution or that transition from blast furnace steel making to EAF steel making as they did in the United States, and so they've got sort of a double situation going on in Europe right now. Yeah, well, it, it, fortunately in Europe, they can align it all with a lot of the assets, you know, blast furnaces needing relines so they could recapitalize with different technology. But yeah. the, 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 you make a great point here, you know, because think about all this happening, the sea change that we talked about um, in the U.S. And, and at the time, it, it, you know, why, it, you talk about the EU, it's happening for regulatory reasons under the emissions trading system. But think about in the U.S. and what happened in a voluntary market. And this is what I've learned about carbon accounting is really it's just a laser focus on energy consumption. And think about month in and month out, every month we would look at energy intensity, energy intensity. Yeah. And, and, and then you fast forward to today and you just turn that energy intensity into carbon intensity. And lo yeah. and behold, here in the U.S., you know, 70 some percent electric arc furnace for, for all the right reasons focused on efficiency is now also the, some of the lowest footprint produced steel in the U.S. Yeah, that's an interesting take, Randy. You know, it, well, you're right. It was about energy intensity. I mean, yeah. I'd love to say that we were noble back then in the industry, and we were trying to, yeah. to lower the energy efficiencies for uh, reducing power usage and all those things that made it more of a sustainable product, even way back then. But we didn't probably look at it as much from that lens or that perspective. It was really about lowering the cost and the energy efficiency because it right. cost us so much. But you're right, the, the intensity now is the intensity of viewing of the way we view our industry is on carbon. It's uh, uh you're so, that's well well put, Randy. Well put. Well, it's it's it, hey, uh, let's let's just jump right into this uh, a particular yeah. experience. And I'm going to share um, just some background with the folks that are watching uh, today. You know, uh, I guess well, maybe three years ago that uh, my wife and I uh, visited with your wife and I up in Memphis and you were just packing up the house, actually selling it on a estate <laughs> sale. Packing yeah. up the family, moving to Sweden, man. And uh, 
really, that was the genesis of my company, uh, Greenway Steel, because I, I got I got a little bit of a, a take on what you were doing. So I started researching this and I just said, oh, it's amazing. But remember at the time, you and I were talking, we're saying, man, they don't need another three million tons of flat road in, in the EU. And, but then, you know, you get over there and next thing you know, you, I have all the respect in the world for you. You sold out half of a mill before it was even produced. And that's never happened in the history of steel making, man. And, and it's just fascinating. So maybe uh, some of your experiences, both personally, you know, creating a sales network yeah. in, in, in the EU. But then, too, we could dive into some of what um, surrounds the demand for green steel that you saw. Yeah, yeah. You know, Randy, I, first I want to say I appreciate you saying that I sold it, right? I, I did not. I, I was part of a team, and I know you yeah. know that, but I want to make sure everybody else knows that too, that, that there's no one person that can do this. Just as I believe there's no one company that can transition in this industry, it's going to take a lot of people and a lot of partnerships really to transition 2 billion tons uh, to be more less less carbon intensive. And so, um, you know, I think H2 has done a phenomenal job. Right? They just raised six and a half billion euros to, yeah. to finance really a fully integrated supply chain or value chain. Um, it's, it's crazy to think about the money that they've been able to raise. And I think the reason that company has done it is there's an awful lot of uh, mixing of people who, you know, were probably old school and had one way of doing it, new dreamers and visionaries, and and then people that really knew how to get it done, right, from a financing standpoint. Financing is the first hurdle. There's a lot of hurdles for any project to be able to start something up. But I think what we did is we uh, early on uh, in the in the EU and at that at that employer uh, realized that there was a, a policy that was changing, but that the industry wasn't changing very fast. You know that some of the even the leaders of what we thought would be a decarbonization steel play, they were promising 2030, 2035, 2050 before they really even started to decarbonize at all. And so uh, this investor group, the founders of this of this uh, company, decided they wanted to move the industry faster. They saw an opportunity. They started talking with automotive companies, uh, particularly the OEMs, and said, you know, do you need to decarbonize your supply chain? You know, you're 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 interested in electric vehicles and all these good things. But what about your steel? Because it's a high intensity, high carbon intensity product. And the automotive company showed a lot of interest. And so that's sort of where it started. But I think there was a little bit of uh, thinking, OK, gosh, the automotive companies buy they buy millions of tons. So that'll be easy. Let's just sell the automotive companies. And I think what you have to realize is there's got to be some pragmatic approach to pre-selling a steel mill, as you asked in your question. Yeah. You know, you can't just you can't go out and sell five or 10 customers in the steel industry. It just doesn't work that way. Right. So the idea is you've got to develop a plan that's marketable and that's bankable. And so where did we see the biggest opportunity? I would say a few months into it, what became very apparent was the science-based target initiative. Um, that science-based oh, yeah. target, SBTI, uh, yep. seemed to be a really good target list for us to go after companies that realized oh, yeah. that they had a commitment both to the public yeah. and to their stakeholders to decarbonize their supply chains and to decarbonize their company. So when you look at the science-based target index, <laughs> the companies that were in it in 19, oh, we're not 19, I'm losing track of time, right? 2021, when I started at H2, I think there were about 756 companies in, uh, in the science-based target index. Today, um, I haven't looked recently, but I think it's upwards of 4,000, probably 4,500 by now, maybe 5,000 companies. So. There are companies that are making these public commitments. How do they match that? How do they meet it? So I think that's where we started to see the opportunity to go after certain companies and certain industries that were really committed to decarbonizing. That's where it started. Oh, that's an interesting take. Yeah, science-based targeting issues and, and all these commitments. And really, 2030 is going to be on us fast. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. people are talking, uh, you know, a lot of the commitments you see now, you know, 50 percent renewable supply into 2030, cutting emissions by half by 2030. And the steel is an interesting um, component of it, of course. I mean, we all recognize what 7 percent of global emissions, something like that. And, yeah. and um, you know, a lot of steel mills would consider themselves, you know, it, it, particularly electric arc furnaces would consider themselves green today. In that, you know, if you look at kind of a glide path coming out of, um, you know, some of the earlier well, the Paris Accords and then some of the subsequent COPs. 
Yep. And I don't know necessarily. It, well, that leads us to the point of what what defines green steel, right? What, what is when when you're when all these people in the SBT are committing to decarbonization and they they say well, we're going to have to bring green steel in. So what is it that they want? <laughs> you know, and there's it's multifaceted. There's so many contexts under which green steel could be used. Yeah, I I mean I often say the more you peel the onion back, the more you realize you don't know. Um, and I wouldn't say there's any expert in this field that knows this, right? There is no expert in this field because it's evolving so fast. I mean, you're probably the closest thing to an expert in the United States, right? I mean, you've done a really great job of, of trying to understand it, dig into the supply chain. You're, you're doing this calculator for your customers. I think, I think what we're learning is, is that there may be multiple phases to this. I mean, there's one service center in particular uh, that has developed sort of a, you know, a phased approach, or you might call it the colors of green, so to speak. And I think that was a really interesting way of coming out and sort of saying that there are variations to the color of green. And and I think that's going to be sort of how we transition this industry. You know, I've often heard people say in the United States, well, we're green enough at this stage, right? Because- Most of it's made from EAFs. Their CO2 footprint, scope one, two, and three, is probably about you know that 900 to a 1.2 uh, kilograms per ton of steel produced, or um, 1.2 tons of CO2 per ton of steel produced. Um, that's pretty good. But there are, as you know, there are other companies that are being started up in Europe that are promising th- under 300, under 400 kilograms yeah. of CO2. Okay. That's 0.4 tons. 0.4 tons yeah. of CO2 per ton of steel produced. But that gross embodied emission and who's going to certify that? I don't know if we all know that yet, right? I think that's where a CO2 accounting system is going to be really important. You know, yeah. you look at GAP, right? The generally accepted accounting principles. Is yeah. that what we're going to need? Are we going to need something like that in a CO2 yeah. accounting system? So yeah. the definition of green I think I think it's going to be this, Randy. I think it's got to have to do with the type of energy you're using that you're yeah. using uh, to make steel. But then you got to go back to what energy you're using to make iron, uh, iron or virgin iron, which is of course the DRI or HBI product. And then you got to go back from that is if you're using hydrogen, what energy you're using in hydrogen? Uh, are you using fossil free? Are you using sustainable or renewable energy? And even that has some complications to it. I had somebody tell me hydropower hydropower, water running through uh, generators. That's not renewable. Somebody told me that's not renewable. That's not considered renewable. Unless it's a forced river, I I don't know how that's not renewable. So we can't even get agreements on what is hydrogen or what is energy and renewable fossil free can't even get those agreements. So there's a long way to go in this in this field. That's interesting. You, know, you you talk about a standard for you know if someone says they're at, at at we'll call it a ton per per ton of steel, a ton of carbon per ton of steel, and someone else says that they're at zero point eight. You know, are they using the same accounting standards and systems? And of course, you know there is the greenhouse gas protocols, which which helps to define it. But I think what's being developed here in the U.S. and what's going to ultimately carry the day, and these represent some of the scope of the three solutions that we bring to our clients, are going to be the environmental product declarations that um, are being generated, you know, initially under um, requirements for California for structural products. Yeah. Um, but then there were, I think, $250 million directed towards the development of environmental product declarations under the IRA. And then subsequently, another $100 million focused on low-carbon um, labeling, if you will. So what I'm finding is that we can look at these environmental product declarations with their life cycle analysis of the steel and, and really get into the full scope three, if you will, cradle to grave kind of yep. solution. But the thing about it, you know, there's going to be a, a definition of green steel under a trade agreement between the EU and the U.S. and hopefully every other country that comes on board, you know, Brazil, Australia, yep. Japan, UK, because they all need to to make this thing work. Uh, but there's also going to be a definition of green steel, um, you know, uh, under, by, by, by an end user that says, hey, I got to decarbonize my supply chain. And those could be two different definitions or requirements for green steel. And that's why, you know, we take a look at what um, uh, uh, the, uh, the Global Steel Climate Council and we take a look at what um, responsible steel and their different ways of defining it. You know, they're, they're both accurate. They're both correct. It's just under which context are, do we want to use these? You know what I mean? It, yeah, that's it, a, and you yeah. get it as much as anybody. If that the fully decarbonized supply chain is going to be the most expensive, but it also might fit in some places, you know? 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, we, we, we keep using the word steel and steel making and green steel, but I think it's really important that we begin to talk about iron making and yes. steel making as oh, a separate, of course. right? Yeah. In the past, obviously, blast furnaces and basic oxygen furnaces were matched, right? Um, uh, and, and that was natural, right? But we know the EAF, which melts both scrap and some virgin iron product to some degree. It could be as small as 5% or it could be it could be as small as 0% in some instances. I doubt rebar uses a whole lot of virgin iron product when it melts uh, via EAF. Yeah. So we know that the EAF does not have to be attached to iron making. In ideal situations, it might be because I think there is an opportunity to earn some energy efficiency and some cost efficiency yeah. to yeah. direct feed hot uh, HPI or H or uh, HDRI as we call it. It would be it'd be beneficial to have that, but that may not be the best place to have iron making. So, didn't we just see this week? I think I think we saw this week in uh, in Europe. ArcelorMittal <laughs> admitted that. Uh, Europe may not be the best place for iron making. They, even though they've accepted billions of dollars, uh, billions of dollars in aid in Europe, particularly from Germany and other countries, they now realize mm, maybe we can't do the iron making in Europe. Yeah. So I think we need to start realizing there's a difference between the iron making side, which is where most of the CO2 is contained. It's where yeah. most of that intensity is created. So iron making in one spot and steel making in another. If you can if you can connect the two, great. But if you can't, then where are those locations to be able to create? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say DRI and HBI, right? I think that's the question. It, it, I think it, that really gets around to the, the the main point. It's we call it an energy transition, an energy diversification, whatever we want to call it. Uh, but what we're going to find is that in different locations, you know, geographically around the world, there's going to be different ways of approaching things most efficiently. And and great. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about hydrogen, of course, because that's a huge component of it. But, you know, there's yep. going to be places where you're not going to make hydrogen particularly effectively and you'll never compete with natural gas, you know, the U.S., maybe now. But you could make hydrogen and, and, and what they're trying to do up in Sweden. I mean, that's fascinating you know to bring hydrogen up to scale on the technology there it's going to be very difficult but now they're trying to to drill for hydrogen maybe in australia and and if you could use that hydrogen in those locations you could make steel in those locations or at least iron making in those locations very effectively very efficiently and very low carbon but you, it's going to be different than how you might do it somewhere else you know yeah, you know, you, you you raise a really good point, Randy, and I think this is the one thing that I, I said this in a speech in Prague, I think a year and a half ago, that I don't believe there's any going to be any one way to do this, right? No, uh, no, at yeah. that time, I was speaking on behalf of the Swedish company, and I and I said, look, I, I don't think we we believe, or I certainly believe, rising tide lifts all boats, right? So we think there's a lot of ways to tackle this. I don't think there's any one given way to do it. I think we all must find the best economical way to do it. I think that's yes. part of the, um, that, that there is there's not one process, right? That we've talked about this. You and I have talked even talked about this. Yeah. You know, hydrogen, green hydrogen may be right in some areas, but you yeah. know what? Natural gas may be the right area, right thing for certain other areas. A lot better than coal fired, right? Yeah. I mean, there are there are some countries uh, and some continents that still use a lot of coal fired iron making, that's and. Right. I would much rather use natural gas than coal. So That's is right. there a transition period that is maybe even geographic specific? I don't, yeah. I would love to see the industry change right now to something that's less than 300 kilograms of CO2 per ton of steel produced. But I think a pragmatic approach would be there needs to be a transition period. That's right. They're done. And now, well, that's reflected, too, in a lot of what's um, being proposed in terms of green steel standards. You know, it's a glide path, if you will. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, out past 2030 and into 2050 to fully decarbonize this thing. It's interesting yeah. to make commitments and promises for 2050. I mean, it, you know, we could be using fusion yeah. to make steel. Or, it, it, and right, you talk yeah. about other energy. Nuclear could be a component, right? They're trying to fix these uh, small modular reactors. Imagine putting one of those on site too. But then people might not consider that green. Who knows? Yeah, well, right? that's that's the thing. A lot of people don't consider nuclear green. Green. I know. And and I and I can tell you that the German automakers do not see nuclear as green. So, you know, you have to, you, you'll have to either buy certificates of origin to show that you're not mm -hmm. using nuclear or have a system that doesn't use nuclear at all. And even in the Nordics, 
as much as they have hydropower and they're focused on renewables, um, there is some nuclear in those systems. So certificates of origin are going to be part of this equation, right? So yeah, that's I, right, man. I, you know, there's just it's it is a bit complex. Um, but I know this, you know, every time I, I start thinking how complex this situation is, I know that if there's a better system that you can make economical, that can be economically done, that can create less CO2 intensity in the in a ton of steel, then we should be trying to seize on that opportunity. That's, that, right. that's what I that's what I truly believe. And I think that's that's what we need to do. We need to find a way to decarbonize this industry, and it may come in a lot of different forms. And I applaud everybody who's trying to do it right now. Well, you know, we'll, we'll go all the way back to when we were involved in the rollout of um, um, mini mill flat roll steel. Yep. Okay, and, and at the time there was, there were, I remember all the folks that were coming up at the time. Um, not in addition to Nucor, there was SDI, there was Gallatin, there was Trico, there was. Um, North Star, there was Acme, and we go on and on. Yep. And, and so customers had a lot of different buyers to consider, or a lot of different suppliers. So they had a lot of people yep. coming to them, and, and the competition was fierce to develop the product uh, rapidly. Now, at the same yep. time, the, the quality systems were getting rolled out. If you recall, the whole Q, ISO 9000, QS 9000. Yes. So you had, to, you, had, you had to bring your product online and do that at the same time. And see, today, I associate what we're doing with this green steel. And every producer is coming up with a solution around it. But, they, but it's also aligning with a lot of these um, requirements for reporting around sustainability. And, and, and particularly in Europe, they're starting to come out with these standards. And and we're probably going to see an SEC requirement, um, at least a proposal um, within the next, let's call it 60 days, um, that yeah. would involve, you know, uh, risk around climate, which is all part of sustainability. And so we've got those two components that happen at the same time. But here's the thing about what we're seeing today that makes it even bigger is there's also an element of finance. And, and when we talk uh, about all this different technology, look at the billions and billions of dollars that are behind this thing and it's coming fast and it's getting invested and if you have a green project it, it's going to be a lot easier to fund that than it is if you want to fire up a new blast furnace or coke oven. i mean who's going to invest in a coke oven right or, uh that's a that's, that's a great that's a great point but you also talk about the billions and billions to do it right there's certainly yeah. a lot of climate funds out there i think um i think it's going to be hard to raise money to be honest i think there's going to be a lot of equity <laughs> that's going to want to wait and see how well that first company that's trying to capture that whole value chain uh, in green iron and green steel production with a hydrogen on the front end, that that's a lot of responsibility for one company to really make sure they can prove it out. Because I think all the private equity companies, all the investment banks around the world, all of that capital is really waiting to watch how conditions precedents are met, um, you know, how, how they meet their milestones. And so, oh man, I, I can't wait to see how it goes. I, obviously, I want them to be successful, but the capital markets will be watching. M my belief yeah. is, Randy, what I think when you start talking about financing these types of projects, I'm convinced that there's going to be there's going to be more need for strategic partnerships. Yes. People oh yeah. Going, right. I, I don't. I just, you know, is is the Swedish company that raised six and a half billion dollars an anomaly? They've done a phenomenal job. Uh, you've yeah. got to applaud them. You got to give them a high five. They've done a great job, but is it an anomaly? Is somebody else going to be able to be a fast follower and raise six and a half, seven billion euros, right? Prices keep going up. A price of products are going up. The equipment providers are getting taxed, right? These, yeah. these equipment providers can't even really, they're having a hard time keeping up with the orders. So they're able to price projects higher and higher. So yeah. the question is, is can one company capture the entire value chain. My belief is you're going to have to start seeing more strategic partnerships. Sure. Somebody will have to, to, to do the hydrogen. Somebody will have to do the iron making. Somebody will have to do the steel making. That's why you save in geographically. There might be areas where there are components of this value chain that we're seeing. And I think that's going to be the wise way of, way, uh, of raising money in the future. Uh, I think these strategic partnerships uh, might even transcend geogra uh, geography. And, and those who figure that out first, I think, are going to be the ones that are most powerful in this whole transition period. Yeah, that, that hey, transparency across the supply chain, the value chain is going to be critical to make this work.